Your brain is capable of incredible resilience. Just like the forest that thrives after a wildfire, human beings have an amazing capacity to flourish after facing stressful challenges. There's no doubt that throughout your life, you will face stressors and setbacks, some small, others gargantuan. Bad things will happen, but within your brain, there is an incredible capacity just waiting to be ignited. Throughout this video, we'll examine the neuroscience of resilience, relating it to everyday scenarios, as well as an amazing true story of resilience. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe to this channel. Okay, let's dive in. Research suggests that a relatively small number of circuits and networks in the brain are responsible for your ability to be resilient in stressful circumstances. These include parts of the serotonin and dopamine systems, the prefrontal cortex, amygdala, thalamus, and periaqueductal gray, as explained in a 2023 article by doctors Michael Barata, Stephen Mayer, and Martin Seligman. We'll talk about all of this, but let's first not get lost in the jargon. The key takeaway is that understanding these circuits is your secret weapon to developing greater resilience and leading a more fulfilling life. And it all begins with serotonin. Serotonin, as I've explained in a series of five videos, is a complicated neuromodulator molecule. It's found throughout the body and brain, and there are several subtypes of receptors, each with different molecular properties and different effects on health, cognition, and behavior. Serotonin is produced in a few clusters of neurons in the brainstem, called the raphe nuclei. We'll focus on just one of these, the dorsal raphe nuclei. The most important thing to know about this structure is that it strongly activates in response to stress. So imagine you're stuck in traffic en route to the most important meeting of your career. Suddenly, a pileup happens in front of you. Traffic grinds to a halt. Miles away from your destination, with no cell service and no hope of making your meeting, your dorsal raffae kicks into high gear, amplifying feelings of stress and helplessness. At this moment, you have a crucial choice to make give in to the feeling of helplessness, or find something that can help you gain control over the situation. If you choose to give in, you will feel anxious and increasingly helpless. It feels like your career is crashing, just like the cars ahead of you. And it seems there's nothing you can do. In this scenario, your dorsal raphe is likely to be highly active. The dorsal raphe has connections to two regions, the amygdala and periaqueductal gray which are particularly relevant to how you respond to stress. The amygdala is involved in setting off a kind of physiological alarm system in your body known as the fight or flight response, which jacks up your heart rate and blood pressure, releases stress hormones and adrenaline, and can help you escape or fight off danger. But when there seems to be nothing you can do, the fight or flight response can make you freeze and feel very anxious. The periaqueductal gray is similarly involved in instinctive behaviors, like running away from or fighting off an attacker. In an insidious one-two punch, the dorsal raphe releases serotonin into these regions, activating the amygdala and inhibiting the periaqueductal gray. This leads to anxiety and a felt inability to take action. Research on the concept of learned helplessness shows that if you repeatedly face stressful situations where you believe that there is absolutely nothing you can do, you'll eventually just give up. This by itself is a miserable state. But unfortunately, it won't stop there. For the next couple of days, when you face something stressful, even if it is totally within your control, you'll be less likely to even try to do anything about it. In the brain, this may be due to a buildup of serotonin in the dorsal raphe, which inhibits the ability of neurons in that region to clean up extra serotonin. This leads to that same insidious one-two punch, activating the amygdala and inhibiting the periaqueductal gray. Clearly, you would want to avoid this vicious cycle. But how? Take control. So instead of giving in to the seemingly helpless situation, you decide to roll down your window and signal to the driver in the car next to you to roll his down. You ask, can I borrow your phone to make a phone call? I don't have any service and I need to let my boss know that I'm not going to make a meeting. He considers your request, but shakes his head. No. Persistent, you try with the driver in the lane to your left. She accepts. You tell her the number to dial, your boss picks up, and you explain the situation. He isn't happy about it, but he lets you off the hook. This may seem like a small win, 
but within your brain, it may be the deciding factor in avoiding sustained helplessness. In this scenario, there is a wholly different pattern of brain activity playing out. While the dorsal raphe activates, something else happens that rapidly inhibits its activity. First, a region of your brain, the thalamus, detects that the situation is in fact controllable. It activates and sends a message to an area of the prefrontal cortex, or PFC. The PFC jumps into action, strongly inhibiting the activity of the dorsal raphe. At the same time, the PFC activates an area involved in goal-directed behavior called the caudate, which is part of the brain's dopamine system. Now, what does all this mean? By taking control of the situation in whatever way you can, the brain shuts down the feeling of helplessness and anxiety while simultaneously engaging circuits involved in creating and pursuing goals. In other words, by taking action in stressful situations, you empower yourself and shift your brain to be more resilient. In fact, the benefits don't stop there. This attitude will likely translate to other stressful situations in the future. This is neuroplasticity at work. By activating the pathway from the PFC to the dorsal raphe while under stress, you actually strengthen it in a lasting way. And so even when you face objectively uncontrollable situations, you'll be much less likely to fall into a state of helplessness, anxiety, and passivity. In this case, you're not merely shifting brain activity, but literally rewiring your brain toward greater resilience. Resilience is one of the most important qualities to cultivate when you're trying to achieve something great in life. This idea was recently brought to life for me after reading the best-selling memoir, Educated, by the historian and author Tara Westover. Westover was raised in isolation in rural Idaho by her paranoid and religiously fundamentalist parents who were suspicious of hospitals, public education, and the government. She had no formal education. She was a prisoner to her father's delusions and suffered physical and psychological abuse. Yet her mind yearned for more. As she details in her memoir, Westover managed to escape her repressive home life taking the ACT and earning a scholarship to a major university. This marked the beginning of a new and better life, though it was not free from struggle. The pressures of maintaining her grades to keep her scholarship without the benefit of prior education, feeling alienated from other people due to her unconventional upbringing, and worst of all, being constantly cast as a villainous and shameful sinner by her own family all added incredible stress to her life. She experienced severe symptoms of stress, including frequent illness and anxiety. Despite these obstacles and her lingering self-doubt, Westover persevered. The trials and tribulations continued, but she continued to make progress and improve her mindset. In doing so, she realized that letting go of her family's toxicity was the only way forward toward the life she previously could not even dream of. While not without turmoil from the outside world and from within her own mind, Westover never gave up. This growing resilience led her to completing a PhD at the University of Cambridge, a feat that would have stunned her younger self. Now, Westover is not alone in her journey to resilience. We all have to find our way through the violent storms of life's challenges. Whatever battles you face, remember that resilience is not really something you're born with but instead must be trained whenever you encounter difficult circumstances. Research suggests that helplessness is the brain's default response to stress, brought on by that automatic activation of the dorsal raphe. Yet when you refuse to give in, when you relentlessly search for any foothold that will bring you out of the pit of fear and closer to your goal, you tame this instinctive response. You activate the PFC and goal-directed system in your brain while shutting down the dorsal raphe and its false hopelessness. You are capable of incredible resilience, growth, and success in whatever you put your mind to. If you embrace that, you will begin to see the full impact of this ability, which has and always will be within you. If you want to learn more about the science of resilience, check out the episode of my podcast, The Social Brain, called Activating Your Brain's Hope Circuit, where my co-host, the neuroscientist Taylor Guthrie and I, discuss these topics, including important caveats, like the fact that most of this neuroscience work, this research I've mentioned in this video, has been done on rats, but why there's still good reason to believe that it translates to humans. Also, if you want to learn about the neuroscience of positive emotions in general, check out my video called Igniting Positive Emotions, where I explain how to use what we know about the brain to increase your own happiness. Also, be sure to like and subscribe to this channel 
And by the way, if you enjoy these videos, sign up for Sense of Mind's Patreon by going to patreon.com slash sense of mind. You'll get access to exclusive live streams and blog posts, as well as a growing community of like-minded neuroscience enthusiasts. This channel is 100% dependent on viewers like you. So thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.